Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Open Active Adoption Engagement Forum, first one of 2023 on Friday, the 20th of January. Um, good to see everyone here. Uh, just to uh, begin with, just um, quickly uh, do the usual reminder for everyone on the call, or I think probably already in there, but just in case anyone is watching the recording and you're not already, then please do join our Slack workspace. And that is the best place to keep up to date with all the latest uh, things going on in Open Active, and especially to do with the Adoption Engagement Forum. Keep up to date with what uh, what the latest agendas were and all of that all of that stuff. So, yeah, please do uh, join our Slack workspace, and the, the links there on the slide. And a quick overview of what we're going to be covering today on today's agenda. So, just um, have a quick round of introductions to start with. Um, and then we'll be having an update on the Open Active Steering Committee from Adam um, at Sport England. And then David, who's the head of communications at the ODI, is going to be giving us a um, quick update on the communications plan. And then we've also got Chris, who's going to go through some of the work he's been doing on a data quality framework. So, yeah, just for sort of benefit of the recording and, and help everyone get to know each other in the community, I'll just do a quick, quick round of introductions. So, um, I think this morning, if I could start with you, Adam. You certainly can, Tim. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk through the steering committee um, and the process that we've gone through recently, which is to uh, create an open, open opportunity for new people in the community to have a seat on the steering committee um, for the next sort of 12 months uh, while we get into to all the exciting work that's in phase five. Um, so this was something that we took to the existing steering committee uh, and shared them shared sort of the, the the outline of the process and and helped sort of make sure it was all designed well and we were looking for the right sort of skills and capabilities to help support the initiative going forward um and yeah like obviously there was a fair push around sort of the the, the marketing of the opportunity and, and how to apply and, and we tried to we tried to really open out to as many new networks as possible because we wanted to to uh yeah get some get some fresh perspectives and and um reach beyond beyond the community that's using the initiative as well uh or already um and actually off the back of that we were uh, we were to, i think to be honest we were, we were pleasantly surprised actually how many applicants we had for what essentially is a volunteer opportunity on a, on a steering committee we had 26 applications uh which we were really pleased about but not only the the number of applications but the the, the high quality you know, there was a lot of uh, CEOs and directors that all submitted applications in for this uh, steering committee. And, you know, this is this is something that takes up a lot, quite a bit of people's time. And these are all very busy people. But it, yeah, we were, we were blown away by that. And, and it's a really positive sign for the initiative that there is that level of interest uh, strategically. So that was the first the first main thing that was really positive. So they all came in before Christmas. Uh, we then had a review panel, which was made up of uh, a, a ODI representative, so Lisa Allen, who's the strategic sponsor for Open Active now, uh, myself representing Sport England, and then Gavin Manor, who works for Substance, who has been uh, advising alongside ODSC, Open Data Services Cooperative, uh, in part of the sustainability of the initiative, and they finished supporting us now, but the last their last kind of role was being a third uh person on the panel to, to provide a bit of independence from either ODI or Sport England. Uh, so we went through them, we scored all of the all of the applications against some sort of key skills that we were looking for in the in the in the new steering committee. Uh, and that was the priority of the focus rather than looking at organization type, which has been um, you know a bit bit more of the focus with these sort of things in the past is to try and represent every different type of organization. This time we looked for some really key skills because the future of this initiative depends quite a lot on uh, the future design of the governance model, the ability to draw in new funding, um, and also some some expertise of helping us to reach into other sectors, uh, things like health. Um, so, so those were things we really looked for. So we looked for skills first rather than the individuals, their history or what org type they're representing. Um, and to be honest, the shortlisting was really hard. Um, so we did we were looking for six people, but we actually extended it to eight again because the quality was so good. Uh, and then there'll be last there's eight new candidates and there will also be an ex a, a, a representative from the ODI and Sport England on that making a, a steering committee of 10 people. Um, this will be published next week in a, in a, in a, in a sort of a bit of a press release that will come out through Open Active. So you'll see all those candidates next week and they have their first meeting on, on Thursday next week as well. Um, 
so yeah I, I i hope when it comes out you'll see sort of the the the, the real range and diversity of, of people we've got in there we've got two people that are a bit outside of the sector uh, with really good data backgrounds and sort of governmentty backgrounds a, a chunk of people that have experience working with open active in different formats and some expertise from sort of broadening out uh, a mix of commercial and local government in there as well so um yeah it's 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 a really interesting diverse group and they're supporting us for the next 12 months on this initiative um so yeah I, it's been uh yeah. feedback we've had has been, so far has been really positive you know um but it, you know it's a, it's a steering committee they, they have a, they have a view of things but things will also be shared circulated through the AF so it's not the uh it's not the only route for people to have their input onto the initiative um but yeah we're really excited to go through it and looking forward to sharing more next week great thanks Adam I think that's um that's really useful for everyone to hear and yeah I think I'd echo that um that last point you just made as well that we're we're really keen to keep keep building out the uh, communication avenues between the different different branches of the the governance between the steering committee and the AEF and the W3C so make sure everyone in the community has a voice and, and has a say in, in the direction of the initiative so yeah I think that, that's really good um as 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 Adam has just said that there'll be some some comms coming out around uh, announcing who the, who the new steering committee members are next week so keep an eye out for that so I don't think Adam can um can talk too much about that but it, just if there are any quick quick questions for adam um while we're here then then please do speak now but otherwise um otherwise we can can move on to uh david just giving a quick pause and hesitation but no one no one seems poised to jump in so yeah um just move on now to next up on the agenda we have uh, david dinage here who's the head of communications at the odi so over to you david Thanks, Tim. Um, firstly, I'm not going to bang on for 15 minutes, so don't don't worry about that, anyone. Um, so yeah, just a little update on the communications plan. So the Open Active Communications strategy uh, was finalised at the back end of last year, um, which had disseminated around uh, um, the steering committee and the, the teams at Sport England and, and the ODI. Um, and we had a, a bit of a push of activity. So what we're trying to do is just generally have more more going on essentially so the communications plan sets out some sort of like key dates where we're going to do some activity but we also want to do some things in between that and just take opportunities where we can so I don't I don't know how many people saw it but we had an idea of doing 12 day to days of, of Christmas in the lead up to Christmas so that was a really good way of just getting some getting some numbers out there about what open active has achieved um so rather than like doing a blog rounding up the year with a bunch of KPIs in it or or or, or those kind of things, no, no kind of disservice to KPIs there, Kanika, by the way. That's that's not a slight. Um, rather than just rounding up the year in that way, we just thought we'd do something a little bit more fun with it. Um, and so we used the newly set up LinkedIn um page to, to do that. So the engage the engagements on on the actual posts were kind of low, but they did go far and wide. And I mean Howard's not here to kind of give um any more detail on maybe chris you might know off the top of your head because i can't remember but there were a bunch of uh, inbound inquiries about the program on the back of the post that we put out from some really good contacts so while yeah like i said while the engagements on the on the posts themselves like people liking it or commenting were quite low it was actually seen by some really useful people in the community so it, we want to do more of those kind of things that just create a little bit of interest in between other big milestones and things going out like that. Um, also, before Christmas, we had uh, Tanya Nadaraja come in and do one of our canal side chats um, at the ODI. And we put the video out of that this week. So the full video of that half hour talk is available now. Um, it's on our YouTube channel, on the ODI YouTube channel, sorry, but it pulls through and it's and it's posted on the on the um, LinkedIn group for Open Active. And if you haven't had a chance to watch that, I really recommend it. She's absolutely brilliant. Um, and if any of you had seen the, the blog post that she did before Christmas as well, it's a similar tone. She's incredibly engaging. She talks about how you can use Open Active and how 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 it's so important for people um, living with disabilities to be able to access that level of information or the amount of information that's able to put out. So um, we're going to use the blog and the video and turn it into a case study as well. So there are a number of case studies that we want to generate for Open Active over the coming over the coming months. So that's going to be the first one that we do. Um, 
We've also got ideas to pull together a case study around a link worker who is using open active for social prescribing and that kind of thing. And then also I, I'd like to be able to use these, these forums and any touch points that we have is, is ways of getting inbound interest for case studies. So if anyone hears of any, any kind of stories that, that would be good to use to demonstrate open active, I'd, I'd really like to hear from you because essentially the, the, what I'm, what I'm trying to do and this is why Tiny is a really good example of this, is it's a brilliant human interest story that can demonstrate what Open Active can do. So she's almost kind of describing the impact of Open Active on, our, on her life. So we can do the messaging around more, the more technical aspects and, and the nuts and bolts of what Open Active does and say, this is the impact that we can achieve, or this, this is the change that we can create if we do these things properly and it's quite a it's quite a simple story it's quite a simple story effectively but i think I, I think it can be incredibly incredibly powerful so i'd like to find as many of those kind of stories as possible but we've got kpis and targets around that which obviously will meet but i don't think we can have enough of these kind of things so you know the more we can get to have a a, a lifespan of this stuff the better and um i think to the same token howard is been doing some work around some interesting little stories that he's found in the data and I would quite like to again these aren't milestones that I've put in the communications plan because I think they'll come up as and when but there are some really interesting things coming out of the data that we can either write a blog about maybe even pull a press release together about some things if we think something's newsworthy or at least get some like talking head videos of things like that that we can use through the social channels and through the open active website so one of the things that he he mentioned before Christmas was he was looking at some postcode data. Forgive me if I've mentioned this before, but he was looking at some postcode data in the uh, comparing using the indices of multiple deprivation, looking at the um, the amount of physical activity opportunities that are in the most deprived areas. And I think it was somewhere in Essex, uh, somewhere near Clacton on Sea, and there was six listed compared to the most affluent area which is around probably around Beaconsfield or Gerald's Cross, where there were 200 listed. So obviously I think that there's something really interesting in that. And it's those kind of things that this is just a throwaway comment that Howard made, but obviously it kind of pricked my ears up and thought, right, there's something we can be doing around this. And I think Howard's quite keen to keep looking at those at the data in, the, in that way to try and unearth these little stories that we can, again, if we can, if we can almost have the, a, a golden thread between what we do in Open Active and those impact stories and these data stories, then I think it's going to be a lot easier to kind of tell the story and the impact that can be achieved if we do the open active bit. So that's kind of my so those kind of like a big overarching idea of, around what I want to do with the year um, in terms of communications. And that, you know, I think the more things that we've got going out around that that kind of prick people's ears up then when we do have these other big milestone things that we that we need to do or, or events that we want to go to or whatever then we're not we're not just going to people cold there'll be a there'll be a you know a fairly constant trickle of stuff through the linkedin pages or the twitter so i guess the other the other thing is you know now we have the linkedin and, and we have the twitter on there as well i think it's really hard to kind of build audiences around those things if if you don't do anything for three weeks and then you put something, you put a post out just saying hi or retweeting something and then nothing again for a month. So I want to just build up as much of this stuff as possible. And again, there's a crowdsource element to this where I, I need I need kind of stuff coming in from the community to be able to do things about it so that we have a constant flow of, it doesn't have to be every single day, but just a, a fairly constant flow of, of communications going out through those channels just so we're not starting from scratch every time we do something um so the in in the comms plan for this year is is sorry this month will be work around the steering committee so there'll be a blog about that and there'll be an announcement as adam mentioned and then the next thing that we've got coming up is um an open active panel at the state of open conference that's happening on the second uh, sorry on the seventh and 8th of um, February. So that's an in-person event that's going to be at Queen Elizabeth Hall in Westminster. Um, the ODI has been asked to curate um, an open data room. And within, within that, there'll be, a, there'll be a panel discussion from Open Active. So we can send some more details around about that um, close to the time. Uh, I think in the short term, that's probably enough for me. <laughs> um, 
but if anyone wants to see the communications plan or anything like that, drop me a line and I'll, I'll send it over. There is a there's kind of a comms ticker grid in that as well, which we're filling in as the years, year goes on. So it kind of outlines what we want to do. Then we can punch in dates where we can where we confirm up things. But if anyone has any questions about that, then please ask me. And again, I'll make a plea that if anyone has any stories or useful things or things that you think the community will be interested in, just let me know um, because I, I I definitely need more more stories than not and more help than none definitely that's great thanks david oh sorry charlie yeah you, that's all right um, you... i just thought i'd jump in straight away and just add some commentary to that that was quite empowering actually and thank you um i just this is probably an fyi but we we at playfinder do quite a lot of work around imd it's saying we started talking about a heck of a lot in the last three to six months yeah. to give you a sense like through the bookings we generate both through the marketplace and the booking system we we can extrapolate that down to anonymized um imd data so looking at the postcode of that of that booker um and, and establishing how well that venue is performing in terms of their social okay. accessibility and impact so to give you a sense we just onboarded three schools in manchester um we to take to help that new venue take and get an understanding of how powerful coming with us on our journey is and, and joining the the ecosystem that we provide we looked at their imd data we noted that two of the three schools were in uh, second percentile um, dep deprivation areas um, and one of the reasons for them moving from their old provider sports key another booking system in the market not open active compliant was um, their belief that we could actually generate new bookings for them via the marketplace right. in play finder so an open active story um, and pleased to say in the first few weeks we have generated new bookings that's validated their move um, and reaching into those areas so it's those sort of, we it can take us about 20 to 30 minutes to go and do that okay. sort of data investigation now that that's sounds pretty... quite short but equally you know doing that weekly is still going to be half an hour a week going into a yeah. into, into data we want to make that quicker um, and we can make that quicker technically uh, it's just the bandwidth to go and actually make that quicker and pull it into live dashboards okay um, that's so, really but just giving you a sense because we've probably got those stories and we we yeah. hand picked them for our own for our own stories but it's not something we're doing like every week it's probably once a month that would be a realistic place because I, I think what i need to get a sense of as well i need to have another conversation with howard but you know he he mentioned this in passing and it pricked my ears up and i and i there's different ways it could go down it's i we could just we could just write a blog about it and say this is an interesting thing that we've noticed or we could start building it up with things that you've just mentioned hmm. try and source a few case studies and that then becomes a bigger story and then and then you're into the realms of thinking actually is this something we press release and start trying to trying to um um tap some people up for so i think if there's more if there's more that we can use to build it out and again i think it's this i think it's this idea of using um using that human interest angle to be able to talk about and effectively spread the word of of open active but then that goes from a bit of blog post to maybe something we're trying to line up people for for interviews and thinking are we you know are we thinking is this a national story is it a regional story so i, th I think the more the more things i can find out like that then you know i'm definitely going to do something with this idea but i'm still mulling up how big to go and yeah. you saying things like that kind of just cast that a little bit further and it's probably if it's not even a data investigation, if it's trying to like I, anything that goes story or narrative gets me gets me excited. It's such a better way to communicate. Um, the idea of being able to go to some of these people on the ground and you know just get them to talk for thirty seconds a minute yeah. on the reasons they've done what they've done and what impact it's had, uh, and turn that into a short clip that we can share down these sorts of channels. I think that's going to be way more powerful than hours and hours spent trying to get to a point where we've got a, a one a one or two page blog post that a few people might read um, yeah i think so. yeah i mean the, the crux of it doesn't have to be i mean if, if you're going to write a press release on, on on these kind of things you generally only work with like two or three paragraphs about what's happening and the rest is quotes and human interest angle so yeah. you know if if it's of interest to a journalist what they're going to be interested in is talking to to people about it yeah. um and it's, which is essentially the end user and the, and the angle is just just a part of that but yeah I, I agree I don't think it has to be over complicated or something that we spend hours and hours pouring over because I know everyone's time is valuable and like sifting through this data is yeah. is you know very time consuming but it's it's good to know that there's there's other interest out there from from the community in, in this group for supporting this kind of idea 
Yeah, yeah, I'm sure like, it's something that Jamie's very passionate about as well. So I'm sure if you just wanted to understand better what we have and are capable of pulling together, if it helps when you're then mapping it out to go, oh, let's try, let's pull a story from, from there and then, like it's things we want to pull, pull out as well. And we've got programs, work projects where we're trying to have that kind of impact. And so if we can align it with, we're going to, in March, we're going to be doing this, we'll be able to extrapolate some data which can feed into a story in April. Like, at least we can time it and embed it so it's not an additional piece of work, it's just complementary. That's great. Thanks, Charlie. So, hi, David. Um, yeah, no, appreciate all the um, updates have been coming through LinkedIn. I try and like and share when I can or, or do something with them. But um, yeah, it's good just to see the, the momentum. Um, what I was just going to suggest is that I don't know whether it's worthwhile creating a Slack channel or something which people can kind of share anything for those um, posts or whatever, just because often there'll be things that pop up and you're like, if you wait until this call, you just end up like forgetting that it could be valuable in that context. Yeah, that's um, a good idea, actually, because I think that, I mean, the, the Slack channels it is, maybe it does need just a a, a comms ideas one, because I, I mean, I, I, I'm just looking at my Slack at the moment. I've got three different, three different organization ones that I've got, and then multiple channels within that. But if there's a dedicated one where I know I can just dip into it every couple of days or so and see ideas and chase them up, that actually, that'd be a really good idea. And on the on the flip side, I've seen it work well. Where basically, if if you're posting, then share that you've posted in that channel. Then the people in that channel will see it and then like it. It'll, it gets quite a lot more amplification if you do. So just have it have that going in the same way. We've got some interesting data that we share with our customers that are using open data and could quite easily be made public. Um, so yeah, if there's a mechanism to communicate that and communicate back when things are going out i think that would just be helpful cool thanks tom no problems great thanks uh, charlie and tom and david um are there any other questions for david cool that sounds good uh just to pick up on, on one thing that david mentioned in relation to the um sort of connections that have come through the the 12 datas of christmas that we ran um one of those organizations is uh, is based in devon and and kind of working on a quite an exciting potentially implementation of open active so we're hoping to get them to come along to an aef and talk talk about the work that they're, they're doing it in a, in a month or two's time once once it's a bit more um well formed and, and in a position where, where they can talk about it so yeah yeah that uh that hopefully will be coming up in a aef sometime soon Great. Uh, so I'll just uh, share my screen again, because I think we're over to Chris next on the agenda and he has a couple of slides uh, to support what he's going to talk about. So I will start sharing again uh, now. And over to you, Chris. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Hope everyone is all well. Um, so I'm just going to have a, a quick chat about the data quality reporting framework um, work that's been going on um, for the past few months um, within open active um more than happy to share the actual framework with everyone at the end of this call i can drop it in the chat or something but it is on the i did share it on the slack channel um last month and how i did share it with all of the members of the w3c community as well but if anyone hasn't seen it and doesn't and wants a copy please let me know and uh, i said i can forward you on that copy it's absolutely fine so I'm just going to go through um, a bit of background and context around this reporting framework, you know, look, you know, why we need one, how it's going to work, what's our initial focus going to be, how do we define that, you know, good data quality, what will this reporting framework potentially look like, and then, you know, next steps um, that we're going to take after that. So I'll just give you some, you know, background and context, first of all. So um, Open Active, you know, I think roughly what sixth year potentially um, in apologies if it's a slightly longer um, I think Nick might have to correct me on that if it is a bit longer um, but it's grown you know significantly significantly in the range of data publishers and the number of variety of opportunities for sport and physical activity so as the initiative you know scales and approaches that maturity it's an ideal time to broaden the focus from opening up the data to exploring the whole experience of you know creating sharing using open active data you know, in order to create that value, but both economic and, and social. 
Um, so, you know, two prong attack here, you know, where we've received a lot of feedback from data users that's highlighted, you know, inconsistencies with the data in terms of the quality. And obviously that is going to impact and has been an impact in the end user experience. Um, but then this phase of the, of the initiative that we're in at the moment um, is also aligned with Sport England's Uniting the Movement. And it's one of the main objectives of this phase of Open Active, you know, creating this data quality reporting framework. So we want to understand better where Open Active data can support, you know, new use cases. And, you know, by improving the quality of the data, um, this should be a good step towards, you know, meeting that aim. So in terms of how will it work? So again, more sort of context and background. Um, if you're on the W3C call uh, last October, uh, we had members from the Data Quality Hub who are uh, based in the Office of National Statistics. Now they came along um, to present um, around uh, their model of called Data Quality Action Planning. Um, so from this stance of sort of data quality reporting, um, what they do is they kind of look at we were, you know, we don't want to just focus on what the data is at the end and think, oh, let's just fix it so it looks good and it meets what our needs are. We need to take, you know, take those steps back and right to the beginning and actually looking at data from, say, a use case perspective rather than trying to fix the, you know, you know, paper the crap uh, cracks at the end. So the D two the D U reporting framework was essentially adapted from that work, which has said it's enabled to focus the attention on the purposes that the data is being used for rather as I said you know just to fix it to fit the narrative now uh the purposes um they're more commonly as it referred to say as, as use cases oh thank you nick so i just seen your comment there sorry thank you um yes yeah, so the more commonly referred to as use cases which are you know different way that open active standards and specifications uh, can be used to take an advantage of an opportunity to make those people uh, be more active now, when we look at a use case through a data quality lens, there's a few questions that we have to ask ourselves. So we have to thought, you know, firstly, what do we need from the data? So what we what we're calling critical data elements, that's what we need to identify. So what are those elements that's going to be needed for um, a participant or a user to make that informed decision that yes, this activity is the right one for me? Uh, we then want to consider obviously what good quality looks like. We then want to develop some measures or metrics to describe what the current state is of that data. We then want to obviously report on the measures on a regular basis. Uh, and then we refer to these to identify and drive actions to improve data qualities uh, in ways that would directly support the, the purpose. So, you know, from this, the proposal was then to develop and publish a data quality dashboard that displays data quality metrics that describe the state of open active data. Uh, you know, allowing then data publishers to identify and target areas for the improvement and enrichment um, of the data. So by focusing on the use case approach, this allows them for more meaningful discussions and decisions about the quality of data, rather than just saying, well, this is good data and this is bad data. So it's just, that, as I said, focusing more on that side of the things. Now, what is our initial focus? So the initial focus now, if this first stage we'll call it of the reporting framework is those core use cases of the initiative which are discovery and booking so just very very basic um, you know to find a suitable activity you know a user would, would need to know several things and so those things it can include but not limited to you know the what so you know what what's the name what's the description what the activity fields um, where, so where is the um, location that, you know, we can either use the lat long coordinates or we can use the postcode. Um, when is this activity? So, you know, indicated by the start and end dates and times. Uh, and then how much is the activity? So, you know, it's indicated by either a price offer or there's a flag to indicate there's, you know, no cost. Now, obviously, there is a lot more additional information that's required for a user to decide if the activity is right for them, you know, for example, is it, you know, the difficulty level or, you know, age restrictions. Um, but as this work progresses, these are going to be explored further. And again, all views from the community on those additional fields to be included, or, you know, would be welcome. Um, for booking, you know, this is just for a user to have that effective booking experience, you know, the what they need is that URL that takes the user directly to the booking page for the chosen activity. But we do recognize that this may not be available for all activities um, and the price of an activity may vary depending on the user 
being a registered member or not and if there's any obviously other offers that are going on or not so then we have to ask ourselves you know okay so how do we define this good data quality so you know how do we define you know what's good what's bad I'm not going to get you know too bogged down in the technical terms, um, but you know what we are going to use is something called data quality dimensions, and these are what measure the quality of data. There are many, many, many dimensions out there um, in the ether that can uh, be used, but you mainly you know there's a lot of people that just have the staple of their six um, that people you will use to measure the actual data. And I'll give you a couple of examples um, of some now. So one we have is completeness. Now, a completeness dimension is not just, uh, you know, we will look, we want to look at, okay, is data missing? But it's more a case of, in this context, are those critical data elements present that we've identified? We don't want to just say to someone, oh, that's missing, go and send it. And then next week or whenever they republish the data, it, the same thing happens again and again. So it's all about what's starting at the beginning and fit, finding out, okay, what is the reason why this is missing every week? But as I said, it's more to do with those critical data elements you know are those relevant records included within the data set what is that impact of that missing data you know if, in terms of the end user experience um now within the open active data you know we've identified you know quite a few fields that we can test for the completeness which includes you know the activity type and the location and the cost for example um, another example of a data quality measure is validity uh, so this is more around, you know, is the data valid? Is it in? Is it within those expected formats and ranges? Now, obviously, the open active validator, you know, the tools they perform many, many checks of validity, but you know, other tests potentially, you know, can be explored. So, a postcode may be present and might be in the correct alphanumeric format, but actually may not be a valid postcode. So, you know, this is this is the kind of things that we're going to try and see what we can work on going forward. Now, what will it look like? So, Tim, if you can just swing to the next slide just for a second. Now, this here is live information. We haven't picked on these two um, operators um, on purpose or anything. I think these are just the first two that Howard uh, came across within the data feed. So what we're potentially looking at here. So you're going to see here that we're looking at certain metrics. So you can see... If we look, take a look at the example on the left, so Leisure SK set sessions, they have 40, 471 um, to do with the feed. The data that Howard downloaded was on the 17th. So the first one we've looked at is around the matching the open active activity list. Now that's sitting at 0% because they haven't matched any of their activities to the actual activity list. Um, does the session have a course and a, um, sorry, does the session of course have a description? 99% of it does. Um, does it have an activity label, name or description? All of the data does. Um, session or course has a geographic coordinates or a valid postcode. Yep, all does there. Session or course is a future start date. Yes. The session or course has a unique booking URL. Um, now, potentially this just may be because they have no booking for um, uh, availabilities within the system. I'm not too sure, but we're looking at um, zero at the moment. But these are the kind of sort of headline figures that we look at that publishers can then look into further and think, okay, well, what is actually happening there? Is it just the fact they don't have any booking capabilities or is there actually an issue that there is, that's, there is a URL, but it's just taken to the homepage rather than going through to the actual booking page. So that's the kind of snapshot that we're looking at. And as I said, these are just example metrics that we've sort of picked out to begin with to look at. So, you know, matching to the activity list, has it a description? Is there a valid postcode, et cetera, et cetera. These are elements that can be discussed further and we can look at, you know, well, this would be more important to us, this you know, particular field and this field is more important to us. But we'd like to know the, visil uh, the vali validity of this one or we would like to know the timeliness of this field. So there's a lot more things that we can be doing um, going forward. So the next steps. Um, so we've been looking at getting some developer resource, which is now in place um, and they'll be working with Howard um, to sort of build a dashboard and they're looking at the timelines of that. Now, the potential plan, if everyone has seen it or not, but the status page on the Open Active website or the, um, the I think commonly known as like the data dashboard where you have all the list of feeds um, and the actual provider, the publishers there. If you imagine across there, a completeness score, a validity score, an accuracy score, et cetera, et cetera. And those 
percentages will be an extra there. So that's the kind of vision we have at the moment for it. However, you know, we're looking to welcome all comments, suggestions, ideas, and options, you know, on again the sort of proposed set of these DQ measures, but also the best means how to publish them. So is it the status page, you know, in the spirit of openness, is that the best place to do it, or should it be somewhere completely different? Um, and just focused on those dimensions. Uh, sorry, just uh, focus on those uh, uh, those metrics. Um, now, as I said, the measures in the dashboards are going to be refined over the coming months, um, again, with collaboration from the community. Now, timelines, I think we're looking at a final framework around November, but we're hoping, obviously, if we can publish this earlier, we can, um, whether a draft version gets published first of all, and then we do some tweaks to it, but... Um, I can always come back to this group and uh, have a bit more confirmation around timelines um, in the future. But essentially, that, that's where what we've been doing in the, in the last few months is kind of building to that point where, you know, we're able to then get the data and actually look at certain metrics that are measured against dimensions to see, OK, are there any potential issues? I know there's only two here now. We're going to be working on, obviously, more and more of these um, over the coming months. And, you know, um, as I said, welcome any comments and help and assistance and uh, the kind of things that if they, if you are noticing any potential data quality issues that you think well actually is this a chance that this could be measured could this be included in the dashboard then please you know either drop myself howard uh, an email a call um, come back to the group and we can discuss all these further so um thanks very much for your time um and yeah uh, uh, tim if you want to stop sharing obviously now uh, by all means you can so thank you all Great. Thanks, Chris. I think that's uh, really useful, I guess, just to say that the majority of this work will sort of be going on with the W3C group, I think. Is that, that that's right? Um, but I think it's really useful uh, for this group as well to be aware. And I, th I think this could be a really valuable tool um, for the people in this group when we're having engagements and and um, and talking to people around the sector and around the community. It could be, could be a really useful tool to, to help with that. So, um, did anyone have any questions for Chris? I was just going to say great work. No, that's it's been needed for a while. And I think just quite clearly you can see um, where the issues might be on a case by case basis. So no, really good work with that. Well, thank you. I'll pass that on to Howard as well. So Howard, if you're watching, well done. I'd, uh, I'd, 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 I'd echo that. Like, I think we've fallen foul of trying to spin too many plates and do too many things. And we, we've talked about the problems we've got and data quality is just one that just continually comes up. And I, I think there's a point at which, and looks like the point has arrived where we've not just gone right, we need to solve that, but we're actually doing the solving um, and just focusing on a single priority almost and go, let's spin one plate and do that plate well rather than <laughs> try and do too much. So yeah, really exciting. And then thank you for picking it up and championing. No worries. Thank you all. Great. Well, that's some really positive feedback for you, Chris. So it gives you some uh, momentum to to take forward. That's great. Um, we've we've flown through the agenda today. So so that was that was actually everything we've had. So we're now just um, onto any other business. So I don't know if anyone has anything that they're working on or or any um, little tidbits that they just wanted to bring up right at the end of the call. In, in any other business. I just wanted to quickly say, Chris, that that is that's a really great presentation, and um, it's probably worth making sure that not just uh, the people on this call have an opportunity, but maybe some of the data users, um, I don't know, uh, working working directly to find out what exactly the data quality metrics are that they care about. Um, I think that would be quite important. No, thank you, Vinod. I think that uh, yeah, I think you know my role and sort of Howard's role. So I think I'll be sort of on the ground, um, you know, find out all those potential issues and then feeding it back up to Howard and say, right, can we try and like, you know, feed this in? Here's the reason why not. Because I don't want to get to a point where someone, you know, just gives me a whole list of, oh, there's 20 metrics, can or there's 20 issues. Can you just put them in? Because sort of, we'll end up having like, row, like columns and columns and columns and just keep going on and on. So it's just obviously making sure that it, we're getting the right use for it and the reason behind it. But yeah, no, no. Yeah, so that that that'll be the, um, way forward is that you know I'll be down finding out all these potential issues talking to people engaging that you know it's across the whole you know community and reach as much as I can I'm trying to be a bit more or will try and be a bit more active on slack at least to try and you know ramp this up more and more and say look this is what we're doing can we have some um, ideas coming forward and then as I said feed that up to Howard who will work with the developer to actually you know bring this to life so yeah thanks for that, Nick. Um, Chris, just one thought that's gone through my mind. You're probably aware of this work anyway, and I'm sure the community generally are, but 
but Playfinder will be bringing activities to marketplace in this first half of the year. Um, it's the most of that technical work will go on in the next three months. Um, we've just sort of re re-established our, our internal project plan for embedding embedding activities across the, across the business, but mostly into the product. So um, it's on Jamie's head with tech team and my support, more consulting to, to be going through the feeds ourselves. So there just seems some crossover and alignment that as a data user, and we're going to be looking at it nationally. Um, we're going to be going through those feeds and looking for where we can and fundamentally can't use the data um, for, for user experience purposes. So it might be worth making sure we're aligned on that if um, if we're not already. Yeah, no, absolutely fine. I mean, when you get to that point, you want to set something up, have that sort of pre-call, and then we can obviously have regular calls throughout. Um, yeah, absolutely fine. Cool. I'll, uh, I'll chat with Jamie. And just, just to add on to that, what's the mechanism in which to kind of feed this back to the um, providers? Because it's it's good great us knowing um but it's even better if they know and, and act on that information so yeah just just trying to figure that out no it's fine i mean i will i'm not trying to speak for howard so <laughs> hopefully i'm not going to get i don't want to start saying oh it's going to be this and this and he'll go what are you doing why have you said this um but i suppose into in turn what i think would potentially happen you know we have this dashboard that's published openly on the open active website and it will just be then I, again, like, well, like with a lot of things, we don't only just build something and then it just sits there and then no one does anything with it. There's going to be a lot of promotion around it to say, right, now this is now live or we're now working on this. Let's now start getting people involved. We can start, I don't know, potentially contacting people to make them aware um, of what issues are being shown because we can't just, I can't just drop a message on Slack and expect the 500 plus people that are on there to you know pick up on it. And if they... You know, for whatever reason. So whether it means contacting them personally just to begin with to make them aware of it, or uh, we do a presentation somewhere. You know, whether it's the W3C or it's here again, or I, I don't know. There's a lot of I have that I, I can't give a proper answer, unfortunately, for that at the moment, Tom. But those are some ideas kind of floating around in the head at the moment that it could be. But I'm sure um, I'll talk to Howard next week and find out what his plans are, and then uh, drop your message or everyone else here and let you know what the um, if he if he you know has that idea at the moment because i think obviously the focus obviously is let's get the metrics right let's get the dimensions right let's actually start looking at building um a prototype and then we'll see um potentially where where we're going to showcase it or uh, advertise it oh sorry about i can't answer it <laughs> no no really there i was just going to say direct would be a good um like just having whoever the relationship is with uh, at that provider just I think if we leave it out for them to discover, they won't really necessarily be aware or do anything about it. Um, but even those two examples, like one of them isn't usable. So like the fact they haven't got any dates, that's just like completely pointless, but they might not know that until. Mm -hmm. So I think that's crucial is just being like, look, this isn't usable because no users would use this information, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just like how that works, I think will be crucial in it actually making an impact. Yeah, I oh, know. I mean, like I said, no, it definitely just won't be the case of we'll publish it and then just leave and we'll go like, you know, radio silent on it at all. No, there will have to be some communications out there to let everyone know, look, this is now live. And whether it is um, a big call to or I don't know, to whoever, or it's just, you know, yeah, we contact direct. Um, I'm sure, yeah, we'll, we'll do probably everything, all of it at <laughs> once. So, yeah. I was just going to add to that personally that. If I was sitting in their shoes, if someone came to me with a, I, this this is all this is the framework we've created. This is the tool we've we've built to you know some for so far. I'm going to simplify this, but the tool we've we've built to help you showcase where your gaps are. Are they going to feel the incentive to actually take action away to go and clean up that data? Um, maybe, maybe not. Some will feel guilty. Some might go. If I clean it, is it going to get used anymore in any new place? It, it, where is it going to get used? And so is it worth me doing that? Um, mostly to them. Uh, my guess is, Tom, if the likes of you and us can align on where that and any other data users that are out there at the moment, MCR Active would be one. If we can align on which data we are wanting to use that's not clean enough and actually apply that pressure to go, look, it will get used in all of these places, um, then that provides the inertia for those particular. We just need to, again, it's connecting the data use with the data clean up almost because uh, if they've got no incentive to i don't see why they would 
Jolly, I'm not, I'm not sure if this is the answer to all the incentive to creating that incentive, but um, Dave, David, maybe there is something to explore here around. And, and Chris, look, using armed with your insight, looking at who has been publishing a really good quality data feed for quite a while, and and actually acknowledging that, or a cluster of, of uh, providers who have done a really good job for a while, and acknowledging that, and then signposting the fact that we've got this new facility where people can have a better look at the, their quality uh, going going forward and and, and previously, right? Because then I guess then there's a bit more of a, in terms of generating an incentive, not so that we'll publish that all the time, but I guess it's a bit more of a draw, isn't it, to try and be like, you know, well, actually, you know, we could improve our fit, we can improve our quality that way, um, rather than you having to sort of go the other way, which is sort of contacting people directly and making it, um, you know, it, it's trying to trying to put the ball in their court so that they're they're empowered to act on the information rather than us um, sort of us kind of uh, coming down and sort of. But but yeah, I want to maybe explore. <laughs> I mean, on that, I mean, I think we one sort of view is like an unofficial league table kind of thing where we can, you know, you know I know, I know that's what's like unofficial, um, you know, but, uh, you know, it's, it's like gives people sort of healthy competition potentially. Yeah. They think, oh, bloody hell, then down the road, they're, they're doing better data than me. Right. Let's try and ramp this up. But one thing I've been looking at in, in, in the sort of short time here is, and from conversations I've had, it is around the value and benefit of the data. So I know that's a big key is trying to sell that to people, you know, and to even like, you know, not just people who are currently using like publishing open active data, but it's those ones that we want to try and get to publish it. What is the value and benefit for them to do it? And then if we can say, look, you know, we're, we're building this quality framework, we've got the use case framework as well. We've got all the people in the community trying to help. We can sell it on that to say, look, this is the reason why we're doing it and be able to I mean, we're you know looking at the school facilities as well. I think the work that's coming up soon as well. So there's a lot of value and benefit out there, and I think that that can be one of the benefits that we want to try and sell to you know if if we're trying to you know pr um, persuade someone to fit fix their data or fix it at source, you know that can be same why. And then Charlie, as you said, you know we look at look, here's the end result here. You fix it, it goes to here. This person then can be able to make that informed decision because they have everything that they need to know about that activity that they can then go and join and enjoy it and actually become active and get active and get fit or whatever the, they want to be. So it's, I suppose, building that story, isn't it? And that narrative, and David, that's probably where you're coming with your little magic wand and go, here's the, the story that I can uh, build for that. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I'll, it is definitely a magic wand that does it. It's nothing to do with me. <laughs> But I think, I mean, you know, there's there's another facet there of, of getting case studies. It doesn't always have to be like end user case studies and that kind of thing. I think it's really good. The the league table thing, I think, is quite fun. Um, yeah, I, I mean, if there was a way of doing that without just alienated people or whatever, I mean, that's the worst case scenario. But I, I think it's quite a fun idea, even if we did... We could do it by area, maybe then. They could say, like, here's the, the, you know, we look at potential cities or towns or something, and then, I don't know, people within that place could, uh, rather than name shaming. Exactly. Uh, or, or then it becomes almost like, I don't know, do we do, like, a little monthly award shout-out for something or other? If we can find something that doesn't, yeah, put people off, but is a way of recognising a certain a certain level, I, I think it's a good idea. Mate, let's, let's, let's put our heads together and think about yeah. something like that. I think you can do like as long as you're showcasing the best instead of the worst, um, yeah. but still having the worst available, but promoting the best is still, I think, yeah, you know, we can, possible I mean, without alienating. In an ideal scenario, it would if 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 other if other people are seeing what we're pulling out is like a, a good example, they might they might either pull themselves up or want to put themselves forward for similar recognition as well. So I think it kind of it it um it acts as it acts as an incentive to whether do better or, or show or show what people are doing, neither of which is a bad thing. You could like Just give someone like a, a most improved award, you know, if we sort of, you know, measure on a month by month basis and you think, oh, you know, in the last month you were at X percent. Now you're all the way up here. Well done. You've been the most improved this past month. Here's a sticker. <laughs> Just to, yeah. yeah. Just to jump in. So I'm just going to say, um, I think these are really great ideas. So I'm currently in like four or five different conversations with operators that are either opening their data or have opened it and need to do some data quality stuff. And I think the underground sentiment is 
the, the tool that shows you where you're at is really great for someone in the company that's been told to fix the data quality because they don't know what to do and what not to do, which things are more important than other things. We can't do it all at once, we'll do a bit at a time. So the granularity of what they can and can't do for, like, and the weight of which data fields are the most useful is the daily, con the weekly conversation. Okay, we can fix location, but we can't do description yet. Fine, okay, please do that. Right, then next one, the next one. For the senior people that are making the decision to put the resources on that problem, their main uh, decision point is, ah, if our data is not, not good enough and we don't have the resources for it, we won't open it yet. And it's making sure we don't hit, sort of hit them too hard with, uh, here's all the stuff you might have to do, because most of them are quite scared of their own data quality already within their own system. So there's a quite, there's quite a tight sort of tightrope balance here to, to go down. So we don't put too many people off taking the first step, because once they take the first step, we can see the data and we can help them but a lot of them might see where they are and where the best people are and be like, oh yeah, this is a, a year's worth of data quality project we've got to kick off internally. Um, so I'd love to be part of a discussion to bring those examples to that, to that, to that discussion about implementation of this. So I think it's really helpful and, as, and an objective measure of data quality is very useful uh, and deploying it in sort of a, in a sensitive way to those, to those concerns, I think can do a lot of good. No, thanks for that, Anish. No, that, that's that's all good. I mean, that's why our focus is is more on those critical data elements, you know, the, or the minimum viable products or whatever we want to call them, so that people, you know, because we don't, you know, we didn't want to just turn around and say, right, we think that this field and this field and this field and this field, these are your four important ones, but it's more we need it from you know from the community, from those publishers, from the operators, you know, to say, well, actually, from our point of view, this is what our critical data element is. So it's working with them to understand it because it's, we, we you know, like I said, you know, you don't want to just like tell them what we think because it's their data at the end of the day and we don't want to put them off. We don't want to scare them. So yeah, but no, we will get together and um, we can chat further around that. It's absolutely fine. Um, sorry, Charlie, go on. Uh, no, yeah, thank you. Nish, just a question from me. One of the big one of the largest pieces for, that came out of the ODSC sustainability report, whether it was a specific recommendation or a theme of sustainability, was the the sort of dependency there is between data publishing and data use, um, at least at that time. And I think it probably still exists today because we haven't moved too far from where we where we were in terms of the actual data. Um, to the suggestion that you know opening or cleaning your data is the, the incentive to do that lower if there aren't enough data users out there using your data um, and vice versa publishing or using not worth it if there's not enough publishers of, of a high enough data quality do you see uh, i have a personal belief that this is the case but interested from your perspective do you see the incentive being important today in the the justification to assign resource and spend time actually cleaning cleaning that data and knowing I, i'll clean that and that and that because i know if i do those bits it's going to get used in that place yeah it's, it's a really good question um multifaceted responses are available to this but my my broad response to that is um generally i think there's a 90 percent plus conversion rate if you can get someone like someone like me in front of an operator just to pitch open active vision no one just barely anyone disagrees with that it's then making sure they understand the hurdles from there to um to them being happy with their data being shown on a third party and um, for the publishers, I haven't seen too much of a pushback about where is it going to be shown, because we can talk about Parasport, we can talk about Discord and classes, we can talk about regional activity finders, we can talk about class finder. Those alone are enough to people to say, oh, great, I don't have to do it four times, I do it once. Awesome. Um, then you hit the hurdle of like Gladstone starting to charge yearly for open data feeds versus Legends, which are completely free to turn on so when it's free to turn on it's really easy to say yeah just turn it on then we as a community will work with you to make your data better like we'll tell you we'll hold you hold your hand in this process we'll figure it out when there's a price tag in the in front or or a recent you know effort slash resource upfront hurdle then it's a bit the, the the onus does become a bit more on which brokers how much marketing are they spending what's their what's their reach what's the return on the on the investment that kind of stuff so it does vary but i would say overall we get more more yeses than nos and willingness to move forward 
um, from the publishers uh, based on the brokers that are already knocking around. Interesting. Do right. you, uh, only other question on that, probably a, hopefully needs one, is there a difference there between opening for the first time and cleaning data? Yes. Yeah, that's the bit I'd like to kind of understand. That felt like more of an answer useful as well on sort of opening and in terms of pitching open active but what's the incentive for everyone active gll right now to go not using them as actual examples uh, just name is in a pot um everyone to go and actually clean their data and will they will they go and do it when asked yeah i don't want it like you i don't want i love the idea of a league table it's it's simple it's fun it's easy to understand it's influential but i don't want to go and ask the wrong people to do it because they'll they won't see the connection to where their data is going to go afterwards that's my my nugget that's lingering thanks charlie i think uh we're, we're just coming into the last minute or two so so one to come back to definitely but yeah that's um that's clearly a, a topic that's uh, raised a lot of interest chris and um definitely definitely one i think it's worth worth revisiting here and maybe some of these other other angles that have come up in, in a month or two's time as, as this work progresses and i think um anyone who's interested in looking at a bit more detail either on the call or on the, watching the recording um there's a couple of recordings of W3C calls um, where Chris Chris has talked about this stuff in, in a bit more detail as well. So um, yeah, feel free to go back through the uh, the backlog of those and um, and and have a watch. Um, we're just getting to the end of the call, so I'll just say um, bring the meeting to a close. I think and, and say thank you very much for everyone for joining. And uh, if you're watching the recording, thank you thank you for watching. Um, and uh, I kind of encourage anyone who has anything that they would like to raise or, or talk about in future AEF meetings, um, please get in touch either through the the Slack channel or, or sending us an email at hello at openactive.io. And it's great to get as many voices from the community as possible to be to you know use this platform to um, talk about the work that's going on and explore opportunities to work together. So um, yeah, please do get in touch with that. And um, we've got a few really um, really good um, speakers lined up for the for the next month or so. So yeah, um, keep an eye out for future agendas. But yeah, thank you everyone for uh, for joining, and uh, hope to see you in a couple of weeks time. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Have a good bye. weekend all. Bye bye.